if at any point over the next period of festivities you want to get up and get a donut, it's not going to distract me or bother me. In my classes all summer long, I've been bringing like donuts or coffee, mostly coffee, um, and students just get up. So well, if you want to grab a snack, feel free to. If you're like, I got here, but I'm hungry. Uh, or Greg's talking so as soon as I come in. Oh, do you want to have a couple of Good morning everyone. Um, welcome to Greg Fields dissertation presents. I'm Shirley Rose, director of the dissertation committee. And my colleagues Mark Hanna and Mark James are the way this will go is that Greg is going to give a presentation that will last 20, 30, 20 minutes. I'll do my best. <laughs> um, telling us what he's found in his project. And um, then there will be questions. We'll begin with questions from the committee members. And after we've asked our questions, you all have a chance to ask questions as well. When that question period's over, we're going to ask you all to leave the room while the committee discusses um, the events and then eventually will be the, the result, the outcome will be announced. We may be asking Greg to come in and talk with us briefly before the result is announced. Right. Okay. So hi, <laughs> everyone. Um, How's it going? Um, there's a reason I do that. <laughs> but um, so yeah, I am Greg Fields. Uh, so I uh, and I'd like to talk to you about uh, the discipline of writing today. Um, obviously, hopefully. Uh, so collaboration, affirmation, and the declaration of content knowledge for the discipline of writing. I had a colleague tell me I'm going to remember that title. Um, so hopefully you will too. Um, but I do first want to thank everyone who um, came here, um, especially uh, uh, Professor Shirley Rose. Professor uh, Mark Hanna, Professor Mark James, thank you for being on my committee. Uh, thank you for your time and your energy and commitment to uh, helping me proceed through this um, this process. Um, and then, of course, there's I have my wife in attendance today, which is exciting, and my oldest daughter, Liala, so Yolanda and Liala, um, just to cover some basics. Um, all right, so let's jump in, since I'm going to go a little on time. Um, as an open word. Um, in the beginning was the word, so the ancient text declares, according to the narrative, that word was sent forth with power and created manifold systems encoded in beams of light and matter and DNA and molecular structures, many of which have only recently been partially decoded by Nobel Prize winning researchers as humanity begins to comprehend the power of the word. And yet those of us who study the power of the word in writing seem to struggle at times to develop a system that allows for a comprehensive understanding of the impact of such words. Um, so, just as an introduction to the project, um, it is a less traditional um, project in the sense that it's three linked articles um, that build toward a conclusion. Each of the individual chapters are um, establishing a proto form of a principle that I apply to the final chapter, um, and so hopefully that will make sense by the end. Um, so let's begin. Um, to preface the project, um, my project focuses on, um, I guess this project emphasizes a complex, holistic, and additive view of content knowledge in the discipline of writing. Um, I advocate for balanced, for a balanced and affirming scholarship and pedagogy rather than a competitive approach that leads to uh, what I call epistemologies of erasure. Um, as a composite project, the introduction contextualizes three loosely linked articles, like I said, by establishing the importance of thinking holistically additively um, preparing the reader to see the rhetorical steps that I tend to take in each article along the way. Um, so my first article will focus on collaboration and affirmation um, using Marxian language of production to highlight uh, the complexities of collaborative writing in a social microcosm, drawing focus to difficulties some students have when doing collaborative writing, um, especially those um, of uh, multilingual or um, non-normative non um, or my, from minority backgrounds. Um, the second article um, will focus on 
establishing a translingual pedagogy of affirmation using um, scholarship in, um, trans in translingualism and second language writing um, and identity studies um, to, uh, to point to and affirm writer identity in the classroom. Um, and then the last article will take some of these principles and step back and apply them to the discipline as a whole as I try and essentially mash up second language writing and translingual writing um, and discuss some of the reasons for, uh, for tension as the translingual approach uh, became more prevalent in the field. Uh, the final section acts as a meta construction of the discipline of writing, uh, pointing to moments within previous articles, again drawing on those principles, um, where um, I have tried to um, create an additive rather than competitive approach um, and, and, and an affirming approach rather than um, following certain Western patterns of discourse that tend to be more competitive um, and, and a kind of reinforcing the census as a primary value. Um, finally, that last section uh, will establish what I call the eight aspects of writing. Um, and this is a model I use uh, um, to, uh, to look at writing more systemically, more holistically, um, and there are uh, a variety of implications when we do that. Um, so that's kind of the, where we're going to go, hopefully, and we'll see how fast I can do it. Um, so first, when we think about, just the cliff notes of the project, I guess. When we think about Western patterns of discourse, um, we have a value embedded in, a, in much of Western rhetoric, um, even with Ar Aristotelian or Greek, uh, Greek traditional rhetoric or Greek oratory, that's, um, where we are, the, one of the main points of that is to create a separation or a partition where we separate ourselves from what everyone else has said. Um, and that can lead us toward competition or dissensus. Um, more recently, we've seen these sorts of values instantiated in um, seminal works by uh, Berlin, um, when he discusses ideology in the classroom and he talks about cognitive, cognitive approaches and ultimately he deals with three approaches and, and ends up landing on and supporting the, so, the social epistemic um, approach. And then we also see uh, these sorts of, this, this competitive or um, replacement um, form of uh, Western patterns of discourse in Marilyn Cooper's Ecologies of Writing, uh, which has a lot of really, um, really nice work um, to move the, to move that part of the field forward in ecologies of writing. Um, and I've spoken, I've written on it in another, in another chapter uh, or another project that's published, um, how much I like that, the ecologies of writing and rhetorical ecology, ecologies model. Um, but um, there are some, there are moments in Marilyn Cooper's argument where um, she highlights the, um, what is lacking in a previous model and replaces rather than adds, adds to. Um, and so, um, with that being said, while there is a there is a pattern of Western rhetoric that emphasizes this um, competitiveness or emphasizes the importance of dissensus, um, there's also we do have alternate um, models of rhetoric that are more cooperative, more affirming. We can think of Carl of the Rogerian model of Carl Rogers, but based on clinical psychology. We can think about um, Baumann's piece, I think, from 1987, um, that has to do with imaginative play. And then Royster and Kirsch um, establish feminist rhetorical practices that are meant to be more cooperative. cooperative. Um, finally, we might um, find a blend of these values um, that allows, um, that's more of a face-saving model, but still allows some of that conflict to happen through the rivaling hypothesis um, established by Flowers, Ian, and Long. Okay, so that's an introduction to the introduction. Um, as far as some of the main takeaways I hope you get from this, or some of the main things I will be focusing on, in this uh, project, in this project, um, we will look at additive, an additive, trying to emphasize an additive understanding rather than competitive negating. Um, I'll establish what we call a commodification framework, which uses production value language um, for Marxist approaches to highlight the challenges of collaborative writing in a social microcosm and the importance of accurate valuing both of ourselves and others um, when we're working in collaborative groups. Um, we, I'll continue building on that by. Um, establishing the importance of affirm affirming the writer or student resources as communicative and intelligible, even if, non, even if from a non-privileged variety or idiosyncratic or non-normative. Um, and then continuing, we will apply, hopefully, <laughs> principles of collaboration and affirmation to complex, multifaceted identities of both, the of both writers individually and the discipline as a whole. Um, and when we do these sorts of things, 
Um, I assert that it allows for a reappraisal and redefinition of the discipline of writing in a more systematic, complex, and holistic way to the benefit of all. Um, yeah. So uh, for the first article, um, we could walk through, uh, but for the we could walk through a massive overview of collaborative writing. Uh, but many people have done that. I think um, one source uh, and, and that was an annotated bibliography published had over a thousand. Um, annotated entries for different writings on collaborative writing from Bruce, uh, Bruce Speck and, and, a, and a few others in uh, the late 90s. But essentially, collaborative writing is a co-labor um, where we come together to write. Um, it, uh, it has major proponents um, like Ken Bruffy, who was, one of a, who was a leader in that. Um, and so collaborative writing has been promoted in a variety of ways for um, enhancing student engagement, for um, helping students get beyond themselves when writing, to incorporate various um, process elements. Um, but within that, there have also been um, challenges to uh, this, uh, challenges to collaborative writing. People saying, um, if you've ever tried to do a collaborative writing project in your classroom, you'll probably um, see many of the struggles that people establish in the in the scholarship um, tensions with students who maybe had a bad collaborative writing project or um, group members struggling. Um, this is particularly important when we have um, social dynamics uh, or so mixed groups, mixed peer groups. Um, and so there can be a variety of sources of tension um, in these scenarios. Um, so while scholarship on collaborative writing um, will often acknowledge the potential for interpersonal conflict and group tension, um, it made more tangible through unequal valuing of collaborators, uh, various resources. Um, sometimes we will see uh, macro level factors outside the individual classroom affecting what's happening in the, in the um, dynamic. So if we look at scholarship by like Wei Ju, um, we see uh, an emphasis on uh, the ways that native speakers, um, normative speakers, um, present themselves in group interaction and um, alternate methods that non-native speakers will um, in in embed themselves or, or apply themselves in this collaborative setting. We find that um, when we are looking at mixed peer groups, that um, the dominant uh, groups, namely white males, um, uh, will often speak more and be more um, uh, be more assertive, be more um, corrective, whereas um, minority groups and um, and women in those um, collaborative peer groups uh, will be less assertive. Um, especially non-native speakers will often be less assertive and more um, suggestive, um, suggesting um, possible things to look at rather than saying you need to change this. Um, and what another part of that kind of interactive discourse in the cla in collaborative writing when students come together is that um, that students of uh, non-normative language backgrounds will also um, take less turns um, linguistically and the converse, less conversational turns, they'll take less of those and they're more likely to get caught off, caught, cut off in, in mid-turn and not pick back up. Whereas a uh, normative speaker and a native English speaker might be more, they are seem to be more, um, and more likely to pick back up and pick back up faster. And so there can be a variety of reasons for this. Sometimes um, we have some scholarship that says it's a cult, it could be partially cultural, not just linguistic resources. And so that's where we have to dig down deeper underneath the surface of collaborative writing to um, to apply what um, to apply a Marxist um, approach in this case, where we think about we, where we think about the resources a, a student has in terms of use value um, or exchange value and the proper valuing of that. And so that's where we get into what I call the commodification framework. Um, Obviously, the concept of Marxian production is not new to composition, especially for scholars influenced by the field of cultural studies. But in connection to the actual work of collaborative writing, focus on this idea of production seems to have been lost in the fray of other pedagogical preferences and epistemologies. Um, while discussing collaboration in Marxist terms, it's not necessarily unheard of, um, but much of the research on collaborative work in composition focuses on what students learn through such tasks, not necessarily how that group work functions as a microcosm of an existing socio-political uh, context or environment um, to produce something. Um, and so some of the challenges, challenges with in, uh, using collaborative writing in the classroom is that um, we as a 
field struggle with these same things. We as a field um, or as a discipline struggle um, as supposedly mature and educated scholars to um, interact in a way that is always healthy if we consider the WPA listserv over the last year or two and some of the heightened, heightened tension of those conversations. Um, so when we, and so if we attempt to use collaborative writing in the classroom and we do it in more of a, and we kind of do it in a hands-off, laissez-faire kind of, we're gonna let the students engage and interact, students end up getting the tension benefit of the conflict zone where they see um, their beliefs, their, um, as Mary, Mary Lou Pratt describes, the, the benefit of conflict, um, benefit of someone challenging our views without the guidance of the um, facilitating instructor to uh, help them negotiate those um, sometimes horrifying depictions of their own cultures or language backgrounds and that sort of thing. Um, so we wanna be aware of those sociocultural um, uh, influences going into these small groups. Um, so that we can, we better value our students, our students better value themselves, and they better value each other. Um, next to back to this, sorry. So, um, if we look, if we, if we take this sense of, uh, if we take this commodification framework, um, and link it to the overall student valuing of an assignment, the reluctant student expressed toward collaborative writing can be explained as the perception of a diminished exchange value for the task. Um, and so while scholarship has established a variety of benefits for this work of collaborative writing, the teacher's perception of the use value of the task does not always align with the student's assessed exchange value of, of the task. Um, and once, uh, and so it becomes less meaningful to them um, we also, we do, however, see established examples of successful collaboration. For example, in Eden Lunsford's Forward to Writing Together, there's a mutual recognition and valuing among the collaborators. Um, but unfortunately, this mutual recognition um, of both the existing and inherent value of the collaborators is not always present in collaborative writing context. Um, especially when we look at, um, in examples from the professional world, um, Locker 1992 describes a professional technical writing situation where um, two different groups were charged with the same project, um, but the way um, the team leaders in each group valued the people on their team and um, or, dis or devalued the resources of the people on their team um, led one team to fail, and the leader of that team essentially feel like it just kind of called it a game, getting feedback from his supervisors as he tried to resolve this attention of not producing what he was supposed to. Um, and whereas the other team, part, and, and at one point one of his team members specifically calls him out to, um, when giving feedback to upper administrators saying um, that she felt devalued specifically because she was a woman by him, that he didn't take what she said into account. Um, uh, and so uh, that was with two groups of lawyers. We see these same patterns show up um, especially, um, as I said, in um, situations where it's a uh, non-native uh, language, non-native English language user, um, Naomi Storch um, introduces two concepts when she tries to describe how collaborative writing works in this uh, group. She mentions equality and mutuality as two continua for a dy dyadic um, interaction, which she then uses to establish four different interaction patterns. Um, essentially, she says that um, there are instances where Students, um, there are instances where students are confident, instances where students are not confident, instances where students value the resources of another, instances where students don't value the resources of the other, um, and also that not all of those, whether they're confident or not, doesn't establish whether they actually know what they know. Um, and so in some of her pair groups um, in the study, she highlights uh, we have people, we have students who test at the same level, but one is less confident and defaults into passivity um, in reaction to, um, because in, in reaction to the belief that the other person is better than better at language than they are. And so um, this is not an uncommon balance in, um, in native and non-native speaking situations, but part of what this establishes is that social dynamic that happens um, kind of separate from what someone's resources might actually be. And a lot of times in, um, in collaborative writing assignments, there, is an, there are assumptions um, 
that we see played out in the scholarship that um, link to uh, a non-native speaker being seen as less capable because of, because they're slower to speak or because of um, kind of non-normative grammar uh, structures. Um, as if that's the only thing that makes an effective writer. So it, it may not value some of the other things that those stakeholders in that social microcosm have to provide. Um, so essentially, with all of that, um, this first article um, establishes that there is a tension in collaborative writing that starts at the field, the discipline of writing level, and also plays out in the smaller um, environment in the classroom, the small group setting, um, that these, these um, social, that it's not just linguistic dynamics at play, um, that it is also social dynamics um, that may influence the effectiveness of that collaborative writing group, and that part of what we can use collaborative writing for is um, providing, uh, providing students, training students in this, uh, through this opportunity to see what the value they have see what values they have, see what, what use value and exchange value their expertise in writing or language or um, have structure or how to um, address a particular social environment or context or rhetorical situation or ecology, um, help them see the value that they have in addressing those things, but also see what other writers are capable of, um, especially those writers who are often defaulted, unfortunately, for, we'll say, the wrong reasons. Um, to make a moral statement. So, um, so the commodification framework as applied to collaborative work helps us have a lens into why, why writers struggle um, to, to both have an effective process and an effective product in the collaborative writing st uh, situation. That it's not just working out a product, it's not just are they engaged, it's um, do they have the language or writing knowledge and do they value the knowledge they have and does their, do their partners have that knowledge and are they valuing the, the knowledge and resources that their, part, their partners have? Um, so ultimately, the, uh, the goal with collaborative groups then is to lead writers to develop honest representations of their own work, as well as their fellow collaborators' skills, knowledge, and even sociocultural identities. Doing so has the potential to enhance um, the relationships, um, or doing so has the Potential to enhance the relationships among laborers in this mode of production so that each laborer finds more equitable value in his or her work and the work of other laborers. Um, and after all, writers are not just negotiating meaning or word choice or grammaticality of a language construction, they're negotiating themselves, their identities as students, experts, and novices in a particular task, determining to what degree they have something to offer to their partners in and through collaborative work and ultimately what their roles are within that social microcosm, which encapsulates the collaborative work of composition. Um, The, so the second article continues um, along this trajectory. I'm going to have to speed this up, um, but that's okay. Don't talk faster. Don't talk faster. <laughs> <laughs> Cut the content, Brad. Cut it. Okay, we're done. Um, so, it's okay, because this one's, this, so this article tends to be more pedagogically oriented, but it builds on that nature that some of those valuing principles we saw in article one. Um, we, want, we want to establish a classroom environment that affirms the resources people have. And so um, in this article I establish um, kind of a, first a value system, and I'm actually going to use the dry erase board, I wasn't sure if I was going to, um, but just to make it fast. Um, I want to establish a value system where students essentially um, don't see their language profile as, um, as bifurcated into specific um, sections, here's my English, here's my Spanish, here's my Greek, here's my German, here's my Latin, whatever it is, um, that they start seeing those things as porous borders, even if the dry erase board doesn't, you know, agree. Um, sometimes you have to work a little harder to make those borders um, clearly porous. So the idea is that, um, so the idea would be, the idea with this is that students have external factors that we use to, or writers, that we use to define what counts as language, like big L languages. This is the sociocultural norm of English or Spanish, big E English, big S Spanish. Um, and so, you know, it might be called, um, it might be called the language variety, um, but if someone doesn't know about language varieties or dialects, they just assume there's one English or one Spanish. And so part of what this 
tries to establish through the classroom is affirming those alternate resources, affor affirming other, other dialects, other language varieties, um, helping students just become more aware of the fact that there are multiple Englishes, Indian English, British English, um, American English, African American vernacular English, and a bunch more to say, to keep it quick. Um, so essentially that is trying to get students to see porous boundaries between across resources so that they can choose, they, so that those resources become more better valued, that they can draw on alternate resources to, um, to accomplish their communicative purpose. Even if those resources are non-normative or non-standard, they can draw on them to communicate intelligibly, even if it's not according to norm. Um, and so some of the ways I do that, just as some of the practical things I do, I'm not gonna go through all of the assignments because there's a series, there's three levels I work at. There's the basic, the, when I, the atmosphere in the classroom, there are um, kind of short one day assignments I do, and then there's a full eight week um, series of assignments that's designed to take students using PJ's um, self to other, or self to society um, kind of lens or Bloom, and Bloom's taxonomy of critical development. I use those two through a sequence of like eight assignments, an eight week project. Um, in the class, one of the things I do try, I, I try to establish is it's okay to speak languages other than English. Uh, so, so my introduction that I gave you all where I use like six different languages or varieties of languages um, to say good morning um, is something I'll do in my classroom to put those um, at ease. And if I mispronounce it, it's really cool. And it makes it even better because students that challenge me on it get to teach me something. Um, I will also, if students in my, in my um, classes that have a variety of language backgrounds present, um, if someone's trying to translate from what I'm saying to someone next to them into Arabic or Chinese, which I've had this happen in Cantonese or Mandarin, um, I've had this happen, and so I'll, call, I'll say, hey, what, what was that? Like, what was the word? Because I'll usually have two or three, um, especially Chinese and Arabic students in um, international, in the sections, English 107, 108, that are designed for international students. I'll have more people who speak those languages. So I'll establish a culture of let's put it on the board, let's represent that language, let's give it value. Um, and so that establishes a culture of valuing the resources people have. Um, ultimately, you can always ask questions. Um, I do this um, through what I, I call that sweating the small stuff, those little moments in class, those little teachable moments where we get the opportunity to affirm someone's alternate um, lexicon, alternate varieties, um, alternate language resources um, compared to the normative. Um, and so daily practices, I'll do a, a translingual, I've got a translingual classroom activity um, that establishes, that helps use lexicon or students' uh, groupings of words around something that often is um, oversimplified when, in their minds. I'll have them list every color word you know. Um, and often in the two or three first rounds of that, they list only English words. Um, I have maybe one student in 30 um, across in the 150, 180 students that I've um, done this activity with, one student for every 30 who actually puts something down that's a non-English uh, color word in the first round, or usually it's the second round actually. Um, and then it usually takes intentionally saying, having them dissect, well why did you, even if they're international students who have a lot more resources. Um, so I highlight that, I use, I provide some, in the, in the document I provide some specific examples. Um, so uh, just to kind of conclude that, some big takeaways that I want to draw on. Um, enacting an integrated pedagogy involves engaging, in, engage, involves engaging students in decompartmentalizing language and knowledge, taking the whole of who they are as possessing potential to enhance their academic work, um, while often compartmentalizing um, into socially constructed categories which become mentally and culturally segmented um, are actually capable of traveling across. So um, while certain resources are often compartmentalized into socially constructed categories, big E, English, big S, Spanish, sorry for that, um, in their minds or cult outwardly, um, we want them to realize that they're actually capable of those resources can travel across course category membranes and so breaking down that wall internally first um, begins to change their practice. Um, this allows for reappraisal and affirming of the writer's resources and those around them through a pedagogy of affirmation. Um, and the translingual epistemology helps students reevaluate not only their linguistic resources, but also the cultural and experiential knowledge that often ties to such resources. So students, um, especially here in Arizona, um, who have Spanish-speaking home languages, who come in and they're so used to people um, uh, 
uh, telling them to stop speaking Spanish. We can think about um, Zentia's talking while bilingual, or um, Aja Martinez's um, narrative about growing up in Arizona not speaking Spanish um, and the expectations that she would. Um, we see students with um, struggles to see value in those alternate languages, alternate resources, and so by affirming those, we allow them to reevaluate through this approach, um, through this form of epistemology, how they come to know and understand what their no language knowledge is. Okay. This last one, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give the very quick version, but I'm also gonna change slides, slideshows for this one. Um, so this last, this third article, um, is meant to dig deeply into the history of the translingual, uh, the word translingual, um, and so it's an etymology or a corpus analysis of sorts, um, and so and it, it attempts to establish or challenge or kind of yeah, just uh, look at the, um, critically claims of newness, um, and also establish what I call an epistemology or erasure, which is a practice to avoid preferably. Um, and so let's look at the highlights. This will go really fast. I just like the visual. Um, so when we think of translingual in our current um, form of it, um, we might think of these books by Suresh Kanagaraja, other articles by Bruce Horner, um, responses by Paul Kimetsuda, um, and, a one, and, and then kind of a culminating moment uh, building, crescendoing some of the tension, which is Suresh Kanagaraja's um, the end of second language writing, question mark, and so this is a few years ago that this became a key tension point, um, and there were a variety of responses, but a lot of people were sad. Um, <laughs> essentially, uh, there, were, there were claims of translingual as a relatively new term. Suresh Kanagaraja goes as far to declare a, uh, that des describe it as a neologism, and which is an interesting category to put something into, uh, building on kind of Hellenist uh, understandings of logos. Um, I'll borrow the Encyclopedia Britannica because it sounds cool. Um, but a, a logos is the divine reason implicit in the combo cosmos, ordering it and giving it form and meaning. So when we call something um, a neologism, we are essentially saying we're arguing for its potential to bring about a paradigm shift in language studies for reordering our linguistic universe. Um, so it's a strong claim to call translingual a neologism. Um, um, but as we, as I dug into the history, I became more and more surprised by some of the um, non-rhetoric, non-linguistics oriented uh, scholarship. Um, many, much of the scholarship uh, before 2000 ended up being in comparative literature. Um, we do have a few that are not as often cited, like uh, Alistair Pennycook's book back there, um, or Anita Pavlenko uses the term translingual in discussing um, language identity and um, kind of the bilingual selves split, the idea that you have an English self and a Spanish self and a, and a Tagalog self and that kind of thing, uh, where you essentially, when, write, when speaking in a new language, you have a new identity or a new self to present, um, which, um, again, if we think back to that understanding of your knowledge, if those hard lines are fixed, we start separating parts of our identity and that becomes a problem instead of seeing us as a unified, composite, complex person. Um, one of the key moments of the uh, more, most modern era of what I call the kind of pedagogical um, era or wave um, started um, as part of a MLA um, focus group committee, uh, space on it, um, the, where they establish, um, the, in response to 9-11, they um, established a goal of translingual and transcultural competence, and so I believe this was published in 2006. But they, they say the language major should be structured to produce a specific outcome, educated speakers who have deep translingual and transcultural competence. The ability to cross between and through and around um, the, their language repertoires to accomplish more meaningful communication, um, rather than more gra grammatically correct according to a particular social norm like um, standard written English or sedimented white English or sedimented West Virginia English, whatever you want to call it. Um, for some people, that's fine. Um, as far as, as far as, an, uh, as uh, so all of this builds, this scholarship builds to say, based on our history, with the, based on the etymology, um, and some of the works go back to like the 1950s, but based on our awareness or lack thereof, or lack of presentation of those past scholar pieces of scholarship, 
um, we, we build on um, the idea that certain, we, we make ourselves knowledge pragmatists. We encourage scholars to abandon conceptual knowledge once we feel that it's lost its utilitarian value. So when Khan Garaja draws on Thomas Kuhn's work, um, he appears to be recommending this sort of approach to scholarship. Um, he says that is, it says um, instead, so we, certain concepts, once they've served their usefulness, they're abandoned and new concepts constructed to reflect our new realizations and pedagogies. And this is off, after all the logic behind the rise and fall of intellectual paradigms as described by Thomas Kuhn. Thomas Kuhn was actually being prescriptive, not, or descriptive, not prescriptive. He was a science, his, a scientific historian, one of the first one, or one of the main ones to um, challenge the, uh, the idea that science is true all the time by looking at the waves of science and the rhetorical situation, essentially, of science. It's fun reading if you haven't read it. Um, so, uh, if, but if we use, um, if we think about Conagraj's work and we use Ken Highland's approach to uh, disciplinary identity. Um, we can, a, a technique for understanding scholars, language, and rhetorical patterns. We can actually follow Conor Graja's work to see that he has a tendency toward um, intense argument. Um, he has an, a tendency toward strong language. Um, and so um, some of the, I'm going to skip past this because I'm covering some of it. Um, we've got to change a little history before we run out of time. So, okay, so as we think about disciplinary identities, 